John Claude Baptiste lay stretched out on his sofa in his waterfront Chinatown loft, a hole in his socks and a stain on his dry, clean shirt, eating Secessuan dumplings from a takeout carton. He glanced upwards from his living room window and saw the Brooklyn Bridge in twilight, spanning the East River on the 3rd of March, 1991, and thought of his homeland, Martinique, and the Sagasso Sea, thought himself floating on the Manhattan sky, and in his eye fell on a black man getting beaten up on TV, he thought of what his mother said, forgiveness heals the wound, blame just keeps it open. He grabbed the remote control, paused momentarily to note how much of a whipping the brother was taken, felt the beast within him rage, searched more channels, and found at last what he'd been looking for. A bottle cap was twisting open to the sounds of ooh and ah relief. The day's pent-up stuff gone southbound. A husky voice from a dangerously attractive lady put his stomach in somersault. Foam and suds gushing from a long neck bottle served up by a pandemonium of barmaids who curvaceous lips and long legs told him, Come on, John Claude. We know you by name, so let's get wild. Followed by pleasure laced with anticipation when his favorite one looked right at him and parted her quivering lips. See, now my jazz packed in that small of gum and was getting him to consider where those legs met. And as the gal do back her, uh, the gals do back their heads and drank beer or danced to the music, the hemlines of their tight dresses grew shorter. And he knew with a blood pounding certainty why he had been born to seduce, pleasure, fertilize, and abandon women. Just like these exuberant actresses whose bedroom eyes and quaking cleavage convinced him they would die to reproduce his gene code in their joy center, which invariably moved his fingers to his phone with the black book speed dial. When the party said hello, he let her know how it was. I know it's late and you have to go to work tomorrow just like I do, but I have something I need to share with you so so badly, so, so sweetly, so urgently right now, so throw a, a coat on over your naked self because a car service is coming to pick you up and deliver you into my arms. Because of his secret life, sex was a game of danger. On the surface, he was just an auditor for the city's human resources administration, well-paid, hardworking, a model citizen. In fact, he was so well-bred and light-skinned that he didn't just pass for white. He was the person witless fools pointed to as an example of white reserve and refinement. The proof of what black people could never be. Little did they know John Claude was a Malcolm X and man and an ex-felon. Only once had intimacy caused him to reveal his hidden uh, past, something his wife couldn't handle. And what had he told her that he, too, young and unprepared for what befell him, had made a mistaken judgment, for which he was still paying and deserved no pity. Born in the French West Indies and an only child of a diplomat father and a mother who was a translator for the United Nations, he'd grown up in Jackson Heights, being tall and studious, giving piano recitals and taking holidays in Aix-en-Provence. He was not well received by the young hoods in the corner with their 40s. Little did he realize he would see these characters in prison, for he never expected to get locked up. His father died in an airplane crash while he was away at prep school, and though he'd won better scholarships, he chose nearby St. John's University so that he could look after his mother, who fell apart after her husband's death. Compelled to bring in extra money, John Claude took a part-time job at a local bank, installing their new computer system by creating a program for a hidden bank account that would automatically shave off a fraction of a penny from each client's quarterly report. He managed to support his mother in the style she had been accustomed to as well as help finance Wretched of the Earth, a budding political party in Harlem which owed its inspiration to his countryman, France Frenon. When police busted the political party for tax evasion, uh, they traced the bank account back to John Claude, who was a month from graduating with honors. Locked deep in the tombs, he wondered what the price would be for not giving up the names the detectives demanded. The answer was five years in a state 
joint. Not a minimum security country club like the other white collar guys got, but a jail whose population did less time for armed robbery than he did for authoring numbers on a computer program. Well, he did his best not to think on these things. That's, that's, that's what he told his wife who divorced him the next day. Now he hoped to spread the intimacy around and not unduly burden any one woman with his heap of woe. He, he never lived alone before or made so much money or owned a television so large. So on evenings after reading the day's uh, mail, uh, when he l felt uh, himself adrift on a raft in the East River, he sipped scotch, rolled the joint, and pondered his dilemma. Some of his late night girlfriends were hungry for more of what he could not give, namely his whole story. You, you hold back things from me. You're, you're divided. That's why I'm leaving you, read the dear John Claude letter he now opened. Not because I don't love you like a bitch and he. He agreed with her diagnosis, but not her decision. He knew he needed every one of his women and couldn't afford anyone's moving on. As he served more channels, he found it odd that other stations ran the same footage of this black guy taking a smackdown. Where the where were the babes with the beers? Hello, Enrique. Who is this? You said to call if my Jones started coming down. That's what the sex Jones T group's all about. I want to have sex right now, Enrique. Is this John Claude? Yes. Let me start uh, by saying it's my fault. What is the farewell letter I'm rereading, which causes me to remember just how good and delicious. It was with Gal Friday, Friday uh, Thursday, and, and will never be again. And that's my equation of doom. If sex is good anywhere, I want sex everywhere. And if a girlfriend calls it quits because I'm catting around, I mean, he wants sex with anyone looking like chicken dinner. Hell, with whoever's walking down the street with the with the right plumbing, got a problem. That's why. That's why I call. You did the right thing. So what? So what do I want? To create the sense that there is no denial, that once opened, the whole world could only open with me, my regrets and, and sorrows heal, he, healed in, in an ocean of forgiveness? Or do I just want to have sex with the gals in the beer commercials? Am I addicted to sex or addicted to TV? Is your TV on now? Maybe. Turn the set off. Why? Because you're fucked up, son, and I, and I know because I used to be like you. But what prompted my Jones was lingerie catalogs. At the sight of a lace bra worn by a beautiful woman, a photograph, I was a man with a monkey on his back and a little black book of a thousand pages. That's your story. Mine's not this TV. It is the TV. Then how come there's no television Jones T group? There is. I, I'm in that one, too. I'm, I'm on my way over. John Claude had to act quickly. He dialed furiously as he waited for a hello. It might have registered that the black man getting beaten up by cops on, the some, on someone's home a video camera spelled trouble. But his attention was focused on the call. Hello, Milani. Yeah. <laughs> John Claude. Yeah. I'm surprised, too. I know I said I wouldn't mix business and, and pleasure, but I wonder if you could come over for a while. Yeah, and, you know, we could just, just talk. Yes. Uh, just have to drive a honkus horn. I'll come down with the fare. Thanks. He was reaching deep into his trick bag now. He'd known Milani since she danced with Brooklyn's Hoodoo Mudras. But as the group grew, uh, grew better funded and more predictable, she blazed her own trail of daring too. When she danced bomb the walkway at St. Patrick's Cathedral with a thousand and one maxi pass that spelled out, Jesus' blood never fell me yet. After the Pope censured American nuns for their social activism, John Claude offered his service to Milani and sponsored her next performance, Middle Patches Jiu-Jitsu. The Ramson being of the drivers who recently added Harlem on their stops at historical New York sites. This time, when the busloads of wide-eyed tourists were dropped off on 125th Street and Malcolm X Boulevard, they watched their own drivers kneeling on slave blocks, getting sold, all in fun, of course, <laughs> to the highest bidder. John Claude liked Milani's sense of humor. She liked his resourcefulness. There wasn't a city purchase material that came through his, uh, his audit, kitchens, uh, uh, computers, uh, uh, sofas, copy machines, wood floors that didn't find its way into her Dumbo dance studio. He felt that he shared a proactive style. 
Along, unlike all too many who got popped, did a bit, eaten by guilt, only to spit out blame, he learned to make his time work. Not by diming out his brethren or running favors for the hacks, but by supplying what the civilian staff needed. When the incompetent prison psychologist was going to get fired for having no inmates in his group therapy sessions, John Claude offered to write him a doctoral thesis on why prisoners failed to respond to therapy. The shrink got the degree, which got him promoted, which gave him the chance to pull the string that got John Claude paroled. Standing in front of his building with a heavy coat on, in the cold night, John Claude compared Enrique, who knew only his illness, with Milani, who knew only his wellness. He hoped Milani would arrive first and told himself he didn't want her between the sheets, for as much as he had been attracted to her, he knew it was taboo to make love but the artist he funded. Yet he worried that if he did express his desire to Milani, a radical like her would find his TV-induced sex Jones a total turnoff. Enrique arrived first, foiling his plan to hop into the approaching cab with Milani. Instead, John Claude introduced them and invited them upstairs. They sat on his sofa, and over a few rounds of single malt scotch, he told them the story that led to his divorce and said that living two lies was breaking him down. By day, an accountant passing as white and harmless, and by night, a black art revolutionary with a sex habit. Looking to express her attraction to John Claude without putting a, her future funding in check, Mulani said, let me break it down easy and slow because I'm on your side. John Claude, loaded and feeling sorry for himself, nodded. Behind the large TV, silently ran and re-ran video footage of the LAPD beating up a black citizen. I'm not saying doing a bit is, is, is not a bitter pill, John Claude, she could do, but your booty call hustle is weak. You're thinking like the enemy, expecting every woman to drop her drawers for you. Enrique's right. You got a television Jones, Holmes. You're out of control. You haven't paid to play, nor have you proposed. So rather than disgrace the race and pretend to be in group therapy, you ought to find out what a real black woman wants. I like you, so you'll have to pardon me for speaking up, but... You mock love, which is not about conquest and vanity and status, but tender, tender care and relatedness. Something's wrong with me, Milani. Maybe I was hoping to, for you to become someone else. Come on, Enrique, let's leave this handkerchief-headed nigga to his big TV set. But I'm in trouble. Don't either one of you see that? Trouble's no guarantee of change, she told him. Mulani, Enrique said, I'm going to call us a cab. Thanks, Enrique. I'd love to show you my home. What the hell was this? John Claude shouted. Y'all want proof that I'm serious? He ran out of the living room, returned with a brick, and threw it at the clunky cathode ray TV. It was a direct hit. The image of Rodney King be getting beaten up by, by a cadre of Los Angeles cops was not smashed, was now smashed to bits. The tubes exploding, sparks sputters flying in every direction like body parts floating out into quiet, rippling sea. On his knees, he grabbed Milani by the backs of her thighs with both his hands. As tears exploded off his face, Enrique bent down, hugged him assured him that he believed him, wished him well, left and got in the honking car service alone. That's when John Claude knew he had gotten over. Losing his best Thursday night, honey, being finding out about it from a dear John Claude letter, had indeed rocked his world. But seeing Milani, a woman he really admired, leave his apartment to go home with another man, that was... Too much to deal with in one evening. As for healing the wound, he, he knew where his bread was buttered. He forgave himself for the cost of getting that television fixed. Maybe it was time. Time for a newer model. screen.